Hi, I'm Duncan Woodbury. And I'm Nick Altmaier. We're, We're the, the Drone Slayers. Slayers. So for the last month, we've been working to identify vulnerabilities in the Phantom 3 standard model as part of the OpenWorks Drone Challenge under sponsorship from Draper Labs and the Baltimore Robotics Center. First, we have the GPS module and the compass, which gets its readings through these wires, usually fed down the legs of the drone. The GPS and compass communicate over a hidden I-squared C bus, which we identified by examining the different pads on the board. If we look at these two pads right here, we can actually see they're marked with I-squared C. We attached a Salie logic analyzer and were able to decode information relevant to the compass and GPS data. Usually, you'd find a gyroscope right here covering this whole section. Unfortunately, in the course of our studies, we misplaced it and cannot find it. So this chip here, it usually is coated with epoxy. Uh, we very carefully scraped it off to find it as an STM32F ARM microprocessor, the main processor for the board. This chip here is another similar processor responsible for relaying the control instructions from the main processor to each of the motor controllers. Communications occur using a 5.8 gigahertz RF chip located here, which is responsible exclusively for a small uh, two-way handshake between the drone and controller to keep the drone authenticated. The rest of the communications occur in the 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi band accessed using this Atheros 9K chip uh, located in the camera assembly, which you usually can find right here. The wireless communications occur in the 2.4 and 5.8 gigahertz frequency bands. Uh, we have the way we placed our antenna with a, using a software-defined radio, a hack RF1 from Great Sky Gadgets, uh, we have isolated it so that what you're seeing on the screen here is solely the communications between the drone, the phone, and the controller. So this is to demonstrate the amount of uh, 802.11 traffic that's going between them. And as we turn these off one by one, which now I'll turn the phone off, uh, you'll see a significant decrease in the amount of traffic. And so the reason there was so much more traffic with the phone on was because the video feed we suspect is also being transmitted over the 2.4 band. As we turn the drone off now, we see an even further reduction in the amount of traffic. And what you see left there is a beacon being sent out by the controller. And now, as we turn the controller off, you see the amount of information down to zero. The rest of the wireless communications occur in the 5.8 gigahertz RF band. So what you see here is another uh, recording from the software-defined radio in real time of a message being sent from the drone to the controller and the controller to the drone. So when we turn the controller off, you can immediately see all transmission seats even the drone is still turned on, which means that this authentication only happens um, after the drone wirelessly authenticates with the controller. So we also have reason to believe that this band contains video feed information from the drone to the controller to the phone. And you could confirm this using a GNU radio utility uh, to, where you demodulate the 5.8 gigahertz signals. After connecting to the controller's Wi-Fi network using the password 1234-1234, one exposes the three subsystems of the network, uh, that including the controller, the drone, and the camera under 192.168.1.1.1.2 and .1.3 respectively. On the controller, a port scan revealed that there is an open FTP server on port 21, an open SSH server on port 22, and an open Telnet server on port 2345. On the drone, that is a subnet 1.2, there is an open FTP server again on port 20, an open SSH server on port 22, and an open Telnet server on port 5678. The camera also has an open FTP server on port 21, an open SSH server on port 22, and an open Telnet server on port 20. So now we're going to go over the open Telnet connection on the controller. This is available on the subnet 192.168.1.1 on port 2345. Now this 
is used to send both heartbeats and control messages from the controller to the app and the app uses this to update its state information. So what you're seeing right now is the ground state control information. The first two bytes correspond to an incrementing counter that allows the app to verify the order of incoming packets. Now I'm going to actuate the left control stick down. And you can see the state change and then up to the left, to the right, and back to the ground state. And I'm going to perform the same with the right control stick down, left, right, and up, and back down to the ground state. And now I'm going to actuate the top left scroll wheel that um, moves the gimbal camera down and up. And finally, I'm going to actuate the top right clip that controls the flight mode. First down, and then up. By decompiling the Java application, the DJI Go app, we were able to locate the password to an FTP server, which is hosted on the controller and the drone on the camera. So both on 192.168.1.1, .1, .2, and .3, one being the controller, two being the drone, and three being the camera. On 1.3, the camera, there actually is no password required. Um, there's an unauthenticated FTP server that anyone can connect to using the default Wi-Fi password, 1234, and write whatever they want onto it and read the videos off. Um, on 1.1, the password is big tilde nine China, um, which we provide in some of our documentation. Um, and using this, you can log in um, as such and get root access to the entire file system that we see here. It logs into the temp directory and you can cd to the root directory and there you go. So we came up with a little script that uh, you can enter some of the crucial directories such as the proc folder and actually drop this little FTP, FTP bomb where you delete the whole proc folder in flight and crash the drone. After decompiling the Android application we were able to find the geofencing data in the directory res, raw, and in the flyforbid.json file. By modifying this file, we were able to increase the radius of Baltimore Washington International Airport so that we were not able to fly the drone. It is also possible to modify the geofencing data such that you can fly in otherwise restricted areas or to make other areas that were potentially unrestricted restricted in a similar fashion. So, those are some of the more juicy details about the work we've done over the last month. Uh, we have identified lots of attack surfaces which each harbor multiple vulnerabilities. We'll try and detail this more in our description up on GitHub. Um, some of the more unfortunate things that happened throughout the course of this is the complete breaking of these two drones. This guy here, even if we could put it back together, the, uh, the gyroscope's nowhere to be found. And this guy got slammed into the wall so many times that the gyroscope is almost completely detached inside. It's, it's really quite pathetic. It, it... Um, but anyways, we had a lot of fun. We learned a lot. We'd like to thank SOCOM and OpenWorks for sponsoring this challenge and Draper Labs and the Baltimore Robotics Center for sponsoring us. And that's about it. So we are the Drone Slayers. Check us out on GitHub.